Therapy Chat Podcast, Episode 92. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. If you're a therapist and you're looking for a practice management system that does it all, Therapy Notes might be right for you. Therapy Notes can manage your schedule, your electronic health record, all your documentation of client sessions. I could not run my practice without a practice management system. You can get 10% off 12 months of Therapy Notes service using the promo code CHAT17. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and I'm so excited today to be interviewing the author of the book, The Emotionally Absent Mother, Jasmine Lee Corey. Jasmine, thank you so much for being here with me today. Well, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, I'm so excited because I have recommended your book to so many people and to be able to actually talk to you about your book and your work uh, with people who've had emotionally unavailable moms is, it's just an honor for me. So let's just dig right in. Can we start off by, if you would, can you tell the, our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your work? Actually, my uh, books have kind of shaped my work in in many ways, my work as a therapist. You know, I I wrote what I was led to write about and and had personal meaning to me in my book, Healing from Trauma and the Emotionally Absent Mother. And that then in turn, you know, kind of shaped my practice in terms of who comes to me. And then, of course, I learn so much uh, from the, just the experience and the privilege of, of working with people who, so, so, you know, my main focus actually is, you know, people who've had tough childhoods. Yes. That is such a gift to be able to do that work. And, and like you, that's who I work with as well. Um, and I love helping people realize that, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. It's mm-hmm. it's what you've been through that it makes you feel like, you know, something's wrong. And once you work through that, you can feel so much better. Uh, absolutely. That's the key. Yeah. And it's a very hopeful thing. I mean, people sometimes say like, wow, working with people who've experienced childhood abuse and neglect must be hard. And it's like, well, helping people understand about how their experiences affect them to me is, is exciting and and positive and hopeful, not negative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in your book, this book, you talk about mother as the source, um, how mother is kind of everything Mm -hmm. for a baby. Yes. So you talk about how, you talk about attachment and attunement and the holding environment that a mother needs to provide for an infant and a developing child to help the child feel held. Can you just talk a little bit about those concepts and, and why they're important for babies and developing children? Well, I think that babies, you know, in a sense, they're probably like sponges, you know, just taking in energetically everything that they're experiencing. And so, you know, the way the mother touches the baby, uh, her smile, uh, the twinkle in her eye, everything is just incredibly important. You know, it's like a very sensitive, almost like a virginal tape that's being recorded on for the first time. And uh, um, so uh, not just, you know, mother mechanically going through the emotions, but mother really, you know, weaving with that child a sense of real connection and safety and being cared about. 
you know, that is just so important. That's the holding environment. Yes. And what do you mean when you say attunement? I know, I know what it means, but I think a lot of people don't understand that concept. Yeah, well, to be able to accurately know, we could say perceive, you know, what's going on with another. So, you know, if mother is just doing what she thinks mother should do, or, you know, certainly I've heard of mothers who, who you know, project onto their children, you know, their own feelings, needs, sensitivities, insensitivities, whatnot. Uh, and it's not about the child at all. So in attunement, it's, it's you know, really taking in who is this other person and being able to meet that. Yeah, so it's kind of like if you are a mother and you have several different children, you don't treat each one as if they're all the same. You attune to what each person is like and what they need, what they like or dislike. Exactly, which will mean that, you know, it may seem that you're not treating them equally, but treating them equally is, is, is misattuned because they're not the same. Yeah, that's a great point. And so the holding environment, it's not just about being physically held. Yeah, right, right. I would say, you know, and it starts, you know, in the womb. You know, and I, I do share the belief with others that, you know, we perceive in the womb, you know, kind of the emotional atmosphere, you know, that mother is experiencing and how she feels toward us. That is so important that you're saying that. And it's, it's not just, you know, once the day of birth, it's everything that's happening along the way. If the mother is very stressed about the pregnancy or not, you know, not mm-hmm. feeling good about that. That can be something that the child is able to sense. Yes. And I think some mothers can overcome the, you know, the, uh, you know, I didn't really want to be pregnant then, but I certainly, you know, I've worked with people who uh, um, they, they were the result of an unwanted pregnancy. And I think the mother always held it against them. You know, mother could never really open up and be generous with them. Yeah, I've seen that too. And, you know, the child internalizes kind of like a belief, I'm so unlovable, my own mother didn't even love me. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And what people need to see, uh, and it's complicated if she then has other children who she does appear to love, which sometimes happens. But more often, mother is not really very capable of a very active, attuned love with anybody. Mm, Yeah. I think it can also be really confusing if that's the experience that one child has, and then maybe, say, as the mother matures Mm -hmm. and possibly her situation changes where she maybe is into a more stable, secure environment and she's able to mm-hmm. feel safer and more relaxed herself than, mm-hmm. then the memory that they have of childhood may be, you know, there was nothing wrong, but during their earliest years, it was very chaotic, unsafe. and Right. Those earliest, most critical years. Right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's just a, a piggyback for a moment. Children have very different experiences, and each one has a unique, uh, I would say, uh, a relationship in a way, an experience with mother. You know, mother's stress level, you know, at certain critical periods, her mental health, uh, the amount of support she has, all kinds of things, and, and her perceived similarity or uh, dissimilarity from the child you know, all can have impacts on on that particular relationship. That's a great point that you just made about the similarity. Oftentimes, I see people who they're, they feel that they're similar with their mother, and they feel that they had a very positive relationship with their mother and were liked and accepted, but maybe another child in the family who was less similar, 
had a completely different experience of not being ever, just never being right, never being good enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and there's no guarantee. So even with the similarity, sometimes, you know, uh, the mother kind of offloads her, her own kind of self. Uh, it sounds too strong a word, but it's not self-hatred. Yeah. You know? Unto uh, a child who then you know kind of carries that for her. Yeah. So even being similar can it can be positive or negative for the child. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, very much so. So I was really interested in talking to you about the the role that the mother's level of attunement and attachment and ability to hold have a holding environment that feels secure for the child, how those factors influence a person's ability to self-regulate? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, it, because in a sense, before we have a capacity to self-regulate, we have to be regulated by someone else from the outside, and generally that's a mother. And, uh, you know, uh, so if mother is very skilled at calming the baby, for instance, or helping the child who's in high distress, you know, move through that and and uh, be okay again. Uh, then the child kind of internalizes, you know, or, and, and we could say from a different perspective, you know, develops neural pathways, you know, that helps them to do that. But in the absence of that, uh, uh, you know, and I've certainly heard of, of people, adults now, who, who talk about crying so hard they, you know, physically hurt themselves uh, uh, with a mother who wouldn't come. Mm. So, uh, and then, you know, that, that lack of regulation early, you know, uh, becomes a burden to carry unless, you know, and, and until we learn to... Um, find ways to, to learn self-regulation. Right. Important. So regulation, again, just for anybody unfamiliar, means to be able to keep yourself within certain parameters. Usually we're talking about yeah, emotional regulation. You know, we could talk about it as a general um, level of, you know, kind of charge or sympathetic nervous system activation, you know, as well. Yes. So when we're regulated, we're, we're able to tolerate our emotions, you know, and whatever's happening in the moment. And when we're dysregulated, we're, you know, we're activated. We can't, we can't tolerate the way we feel. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that feels bad emotionally. And that actually feels bad physically, as many people will recognize. Yes. So... You talk about in your book how the mother, when the mother is calm and regulated, her touch, as you mentioned, her, her smile and eye gazing help the child learn to regulate. Well, and we might say that those things more specifically create a feeling of being cared for and a feeling of safety that themselves also are regulating. So I'm just interested in how the mother's gaze, touch, and smile help the child to feel in a way that makes them be regulated. And I'd love for you to explain more about that. Yeah, I think it's the overall message that the child is getting, you know, the feeling of, uh, of being connected, which for her, certainly for an infant, you know, is an important piece of, uh, you know, kind of survival uh, um, and being safe, that those things help in themselves calm the nervous system. But, but, but the baby is also feeling the mother in a very regulated style, in that, you know, kind of more undifferentiated state, right, that the in yeah, an infant in particular and mother might have. Yes. So I think about how when a mother is feeding a baby and they're also on their phone, mm-hmm. 
or the baby is being like propped up in front of the TV with a bottle instead of Mm -hmm. being held. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of experiences that people won't have a clear memory of and they won't be able to verbalize, but it really affects how much you feel seen and heard and like you Mm -hmm. matter. Well, right. And the amount of time that you're kind of propped up and left on your own, you know, you know, if that is punctuated by some high quality time, that's different than if, if the, you know, overwhelming amount of time is, I'm not too interested in you, but yes, I'm doing the bare minimum to make sure that, you know, you're fed and, you know, uh, bodily needs taken care of. Yeah, the bare minimum. So if the mother does sometimes, you know, enough times be able to be attuned and create a holding environment, then there's much more of a harm to the much less harm to the child than when, you know, it's always that the mother is distracted or uninterested. You know, and I found it rather amazing when I read, I think it was Winnicott who said that the good enough mother only has, you know, kind of be responsive in this attuned way, even 30% of the time, Mm. be good enough. You know, that seems awfully uh, low to me. I'm sure that's based on, you know, some significant work. Yeah, but I think that amount of uh, of attunement, you know, I think is important. Yeah. More the better. Definitely. It's a good reminder that we don't have to be perfect and get it right every single time. But mm-hmm. even 30% is good enough, which is does seem low, but um, it's kind of reassuring because, you know, I think moms can put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be mm-hmm especially if you really weren't mothered well. Yes. Yes. You know, I've worked with many women who are mothers who were not mothered well, but who have become good mothers because they've really invested themselves in it. They know it's really important. They know they don't know how. And so, you know, they get help, whether it's a coach, whether it's reading books, whether it's, you know, a nanny or somebody who helps them see how something works, you know, but uh, definitely, you know, with that kind of effort, an unmothered mother can do a great job. But if she is unconscious about the whole thing, she's likely to just repeat more of her own experience. Yes, I think that point is so really poignant because so often, especially if we weren't mothered well, we don't know what we're missing and we're just kind of floating through, Mm -hmm. kind of detached and unaware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. You know, it's important. I had a comment recently from somebody who I don't know who said, you know, I've got all of this, you know, wounding from my childhood and, you know, I'm not very responsive to my, my own child now and uh, I'm depressed and whatnot. And, you know, it's just so essential to get a hold of that and say, I've got to do better for my child. Yeah, it's such a, a harmful cycle that the person who wasn't mothered well may feel depressed and then because of their depression, they can't mother well, you know, and, and they don't see that it's the same. Uh, Right. Uh, Or they might see a little bit of it, but feel helpless and stuck. Yes. Well, I would say, you know, don't give up on getting help. Right. Because even if you aren't doing it well, you can always repair it. Absolutely. I mean, in a sense, that's your responsibility as a parent to say, okay, uh, I've known, I know I've caused some harm here. Um, how can I uh, make up for it? Yeah. Thank you for saying that. You know, um, I think even if, I mean, we know that attachment and development 
has had most of its activity happening before a person is about 25, but still, it's never too late to repair your attachment. I know so many people who, whether they're 55 years old or 25 years old, would be unbelievably moved if their mother would say, I'm so sorry, I wasn't a better mother to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, what we as therapists often hear is, uh, you know, uh, the opposite. We, We hear of adult children trying, trying, trying to get any a sense from their parent of, uh, you know, I'm sorry. And uh, what they instead are met with is, you know, uh, indifference, blame, Mm -hmm. you know, oh, it wasn't that bad. You know, and and part of what I find people don't really understand is, you know, the need to defend oneself, you know, that, you know, uh, our defense... uh, um, strategies happen uh, in an involuntary, unconscious kind of way, and that there's tremendous need to defend yourself if you feel like you failed your child. Yeah. You don't want to hear it. Yeah, because I think what I've seen is for the mother to hear that and, and know they cause harm in that way, feel so shameful, they feel like they can't bear it at all to hear it. It, Yes, yes. But the result is the child still feels unwanted, unloved, rejected, dismissed. Mm -hmm. And that can be when you're, you know, at any age. I mean, we always think that, like, you just grow out of something, but Mm -hmm. it's not true. That's right. And so I think that the more that people actually can understand uh, their mother's psyche, so to speak. Uh, It it helps to not personalize it. It helps to see what are the real capacities and where are the real limitations. And, uh, um, you know, to to come to see it's not about me. So that reminds me of something I was really interested in that was in your book is that you, you commented about how people who go to therapy and they're not really sure what it's about, but they, they never felt loved. And, you know, it's because of this having an unavailable emotionally absent mother that they're not necessarily realizing that. And then they, they say, well, I don't want to blame my mom Mm-hmm. You know, or it feels mm-hmm. bad that therapy is about blaming my mom. But it's like, well, in this dynamic, the parent is the one who's responsible for the way they take care of the child. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, see, we have a reaction to the word uh, blame. Mm-hmm. Blaming. blaming is bad. Right. Just blame. Yeah, uh, so, you know, we m- might want to say, well, we're just looking at you know, what actually happened and why. And, you know, use words like responsible. You know, the parent is responsible for the relationship, you know, basically. Um, And and try to avoid that little pitfall of people feeling like, oh, I'm bad now if I blame mom. Right. It's like, but, you know, I think the other side of that is when we're very quick to say, well, I don't want to blame my mom, then, you know, but the other side of it is, well, there's something wrong with me. It was me. It was, I was a difficult baby or whatever. It's like. Yes. Yes. You were just yes. a baby. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So they have to see their own innocence. They have to see the, you know, the distortion in the thinking that somehow, it, you know, I did wrong. You know, I was too much. You know, that's often a common feeling. Yeah. Um, and uh, to say, well, we're not we're not necessarily making her bad, you know, but we're just talking about what limited her capacity to to, you know, provide for all of your needs. 
Right, because the point is your needs weren't met and you couldn't meet them yourself. Your parent had to do it and they didn't. And why? Maybe because theirs were never met, but mm-hmm. that's for them to take to their therapist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you you are here to talk about why you feel the way you do because your needs weren't met and you couldn't do it on your own. So it couldn't have been your own responsibility when you were born. Yeah, that's right. So we'll see through the myth of, you know, uh, that somehow it's my my fault uh, as if I could have done differently. Um, we we'll see through maybe the need, the felt need to protect parents, you know, you know, I'd be curious, what, what would it feel like if if you allowed yourself just even a tiny little bit of, you know, not letting them off the hook, you know, uh, of responsibility, you know, uh, that's an edge to work. Mm-hmm. Um, the, you know, what the, one of the blogs I wrote that had the most comments and the most uh, um, um charged uh, and, and, you know, animated uh, uh, comments was supposed uh, about they did the best they could. Mm. And uh, that, uh, um, you know, you know, that's such a minimizing kind of response, you know. And, and actually, I, I, I wrote that post because I had a client telling me she'd gone to a therapist who said, well, you know, they did the best they could. Mm. And uh, um, that so missed the boat for her. That so misses uh, um, the experience. And it, it, you know, we wouldn't do that in uh, other arenas. We wouldn't have, let's say, a CEO of a corporation just totally blow it and everybody say, well, they did the best they could. And, and as if there's no responsibility there. Yeah. Their best, even if they were doing the best they could, it wasn't good enough, and that is real. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And that's... It doesn't necessarily, you know, make them bad people, but the best they could was not good enough. Yeah. Yeah. It's so it's so hard to I think I could say from personal experience, when you have that thought of if it wasn't me then it was them you know if if it wasn't my fault that I wasn't Mm -hmm. mothered then it was my mother's fault and then Mm -hmm. ooh, like now what if well now what if she's really the one who's incapable if it was my fault then maybe I can find this magical Mm -hmm. Formula and change it and get what I need. But if it's her fault, it's kind of like being on an airplane and suddenly realizing, oh, the pilot is drunk or doesn't know how to fly. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's terrifying to think. So we protect, we protect them too as a self-protection. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So can you talk a bit about, I mean, we're sort of, we are talking about it, but I'd like to be more explicit in talking about really what the mother wound is and how people are affected by it. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd probably have to say they're kind of a family of wounds and we just use the word mother wound, you know, as a shorthand of saying, you know, uh, some things in my relationship with mother have been, um, you know, harmful to me. You know, uh, uh, there's an ouch there in that relationship. Now, you know, this is about the difference between uh, neglect and abuse. Right? Yeah. So, you know, many mothers are neglectful, emotionally neglectful. You know, they're, they're providing maybe food on the table and, you know, getting the child to school, but they're neglecting a whole realm of other very essential needs. And they're doing so for, you know, sometimes kind of innocent reasons. You know, they're traumatized, they're depressed, they're working many jobs, they're worn thin, you know, uh, they're not safe themselves because they're in an abusive relationship. So, you know, there could be, you know, but they don't mean to short the child. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and then, you know, it, it, there's this line, kind of gray line that we go over where then, you know, usually I would say from our own, own uh, mental uh, unhealth, you know, a mother becomes emotionally abusive where there is a little intention to hurt the child, to punish the child. And, and and we're talking about if, if it's emotional abuse, it's, you know, through words and looks and, you know, it's not physical, right? Yeah. So when you step over that line into mothers being mean, you know, you know, the, the impacts of that are just heartbreaking. Yes, as you said in your book, and I've heard the words from people's mouths that the emotional abuse people experience can be much more painful than the physical abuse they may have also experienced. Mm -hmm. Yes. The American Psychological Association did a study that found that same thing, that similar or worse kinds of effects as sexual and physical abuse, emotional abuse and neglect. Yeah. So it's no small thing, which is important because people often want to downplay it. They say, well, uh, you know, I wasn't beaten, you know, but even if their mothers are, you know, pleasant seeming, you know, kind of people who, who, who do actually love their children, but they're not educated in an informed way. You know, uh, they don't have the capacity because their own emotional intelligence is very blunted, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, you know, they don't provide for their child's needs. Uh, you know, they're causing a lot of harm. Yeah. People, people so often say, we always had a roof over our head. We always had food on the table. We were clean, you know, our clothes we had clothes to wear. We were taken to the doctor and dentist. It's almost as if someone has told them these are the checklists for being taken care of as a child. And sometimes you have, let's say, a father who is, you know, who reinforces that message mm -hmm. and says to the children, oh, you, you have such a good mother. I mean, I've heard this story about mothers who spend their whole life in their bedroom. You know, but the father on the holiday would say, oh, let's celebrate. You have such a good mother. Mm. Yeah. I bet a lot of people are resonating with this who are listening. <laughs> mm -hmm. So can you say a bit, and I don't know, you know, how easy it is to summarize, but can you say a bit about how people who have experienced having an emotionally absent mother feel as adults? Mm-hmm. Well, it, it, I think it's hard to, until you've worked through this and, and see that it's not your fault. It's hard to not have a little bit of a what's wrong with me, you know, kind of wound. Mm -hmm. Self-esteem often, you know, has, has suffered. Um, the expectation of getting your needs met is often going to be not there. And... Uh, it may even be hard to receive when somebody wants to give to you. There may be mistrust, like, oh, what do you want? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Certainly depression and anxiety are common, you know, impacts. You know, some people in compensation will, you know, try to become high achievers. Uh, um you know, there's this interesting little wrinkle with uh, uh, what's often called um, what I call preoccupied attachment, but uh, others have called uh, anxious attachment, yeah, uh, is that, you know, those who, who don't feel securely attached actually tend to have lower uh, levels of achievement often uh, because feeling safe attached is part of what allows us to go out into the world and take risks mm -hmm. so uh, I would say those are some feeling alone in the world would be another feeling of you know I don't know that I really belong here yeah one thing you said that really struck me 
in your book is some people may go along with a marriage that is long term, like 20 plus years, but it's just like, I, I can't remember exactly what you said, something like just detached enough. They, it, it never feels really close and intimate and connected, but it's good enough for both people. It, well, in a sense, so the, you know, the bar can be very low. So I, I think you could find uh, both patterns. The bar is low. I don't expect much. I don't get much. Consequently, I don't demand much, you know, or with that more anxious attachment, you know, um, this, this, you know, trying to make up for and feeling, you know, just starving for love. Yeah, I, I just think I think it's kind of like what I see a lot is people who have been maybe they, you know, their emotional needs were not met in childhood and then. They may have had a lot of like chaotic, volatile, unhealthy relationships and then settled into a safer, more -hmm. secure relationship that's kind of not connected and they don't really feel like the other person gets them, but they both are committed to each other and they just stay together, but they don't talk about emotions and they don't, you know, at least Mm -hmm. one of the people tends to not feel satisfied and seen and heard but they just don't think that they're ever going to get that but their standard is well we've stayed together for 20 years and they don't the other person doesn't hit me you know well yeah so there's a tolerance for that that you know having survived an emotionally absent mother and perhaps emotionally absent father as well yeah so there can be too much tolerance for, in a sense, accepting crumbs. Right. But then they have like this part of themselves that feels like I don't, I'm unsatisfied with this and I don't really know why. I guess I just need too much. I'm too needy, too high maintenance or something. Well, so self-blame. Yeah. You know, that would be instead of saying this, you know, this doesn't cut it for me. I either need to be getting more from this partnership or I'm out of here. Yeah. But, you know, it's also a a choice people can make. And it may be that, you know, this is not as terrifying as a more emotionally intimate relationship where I would feel more emotional dependency. Right. I think that's one of the hardest things about this is that people may... You know, because I was looking at one thing I love about your book is how you have questions at the end of each chapter and even throughout the chapter where you're asking people to consider what what was it like for you? What was this like? What was that like? And may read those questions and answer them like, yeah, I feel close with people. I have a lot of people I trust. I feel like I have close friendships and they don't really recognize what it means to have a real close friendship, like a deep, meaningful connection with another person. And they maybe they wouldn't even be comfortable with that because they've never felt that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in a sense, uh, if that's, if there's not a hunger for more and the, and the courage to go through the vulnerability of, uh, you know, risking more, you know, then, you know, maybe that's the best that is you know, most appropriate for that person. Yeah. I think sometimes, you know, it's like everything's fine until it isn't. Something sometimes happens and suddenly you're seeing things in a different way. That's what I think happens, you know, kind of in midlife for a lot of people. It's like suddenly they're like, what? I don't know if I've ever mm-hmm. felt loved by this partner that I've been married to for all this time. And I didn't even realize it until now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. So um, there's two more things that I want to ask you about. One is, well, I thought it was wonderful in your book how you talked about how important it is for therapists to understand their own attachment styles if they're going to be working with people mm-hmm. on childhood emotional neglect. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, to, to know, and so to be on the lookout for countertransference in your own, let's say, possibly, yeah, I mean, let's take the two um, 
most clear in, in, insecure attachment styles of the avoidant and the anxious. We'll use the terms more commonly used. So, you know, if I'm an avoidant attachment style and a client is coming at me with all of this emotion and all of this need, you know, that could really scare me and I could turn away. Uh, on the other hand, if I have that more anxious and a little bit preoccupied style and my client is taking a long time to warm up to me or show attachment signals or whatever, you know, I could become a bit, you know, intrusive. Oh, yeah, that's good. That's <laughs> You're just breaking it down so clearly. I love it because, you know, I can really relate to that as I think about myself and my sessions. And, you know, it's another reminder that self-awareness is so crucial for us as therapists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So the other thing I wanted to ask you about is something that one of my colleagues asked me to ask you about, because I, I mentioned that I was going to be talking with you today. And the person asked me about in your book, the, the part about remothering, if you're comfortable talking about it, the, this fellow therapist was saying that they just didn't really understand what that is, the, the concept of remothering in therapy. Well, I, let me say that it's, it's, you know, certainly very far from the mainstream in therapy. Mm -hmm. Therapists, you know, uh, wouldn't take to that or, or see it as appropriate. But, you know, I, I did talk with this therapist who, you know, uh, her practice involved holding, you know, she limited it to women, uh, holding women who had been un undermothered and really trying to, on this, you know, kind of very primal level, you know, provide some of that, you know, sense of holding and safety and see. Now, I, I think it's risky and, you know, uh, you know, can backfire. I've also heard of, you know, a, a therapist kind of uh, encouraging someone to, you know, regress to a more infantile state and then get mad when, <laughs> when the, the client, you know, uh, um, acted, you know, rather spontaneously from that state. Mm. So... It, it, it's not something that I, it's, it's part of the map, you know, uh, but I would say, you know, unless, you know, you, you have tremendous comfort with that and uh, uh, state laws aren't, you know, going to be prohibitive for you. Um, it, it's, it's not really the direction I would go as much as, you know, um, teaching people how to, mother themselves, you know, that's a mainstay of my work. And I think that in, in my own experience, I did have a therapist who, you know, allowed herself to kind of stand in, in a way, not in a uh, super demonstrative way, but, you know, let me have my, you know, like a, a child's feelings of, of excitement and connection and all of that. But, you know, it, and then for me, it was about internalizing that. So I talk about the, the, the therapist is the teaching mommy. It teaches the, the client how, what it's like to be uh, a mother or well-mothered, you know, and to uh, experience some of that secure attachment. Yeah. And so I see the distinction you're making between the remothering and teaching a client to mother themselves. And I know you go into that about some of the ways that attachment can heal in, in your book in much more, much more depth. But I think, yeah, there's so many ways that, you know, unconditional acceptance of a therapeutic relationship can mm -hmm. allow space for a person to, feel a range of emotions instead of maybe only the ones that they were allowed to feel when they were yeah, growing well, up. That's right. And, and there was a place somewhat early in the book, I think it was Winnicott or somebody who I was, um, you know, kind of paraphrasing their work, but how um, a holding environment, how the therapist 
creates a holding environment very similar to a mother holding, creating a holding environment for a young child through that unconditional acceptance, through the mirroring, you know, um, even I think things like the warm smile. Yes. The eye contact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know uh, people familiar with Diane Poole Heller's work, but she um, works quite a bit with attachment styles. She, she works, I think primarily with therapists, you know, uh, um, and talks about, I'm not going to remember what she calls it, but, but basically, you know, very purposefully using your eyes to, to bathe the client and, you know, uh, that, that sense of, oh, I see you with appreciative eyes. Yeah, I think that is amazing. And yes, I'm familiar with her, some of her work. I've seen her work on somatic attachment. I think is what she talks about. Um, I'll put links to all the the names you've mentioned and, you know, some more resources. I'll put links to that for on the show notes when this is posted for people who are listening. But I think one thing that was telling for me in therapy about attachment is when I was feeling vulnerable as a client and my therapist was gazing at me with that nice <laughs> like mm-hmm. really like kind like warm gaze and I'm like oh I'm like squirming <laughs> mm-hmm. and I was like oh this is really telling me something right now about my attachment <laughs> well and we see we have to uh, to kind of learn to become more comfortable to tolerate right you know, the intimacy that is kind of offered Right. And it's funny because as a therapist, if I give that gaze, I'm perfectly comfortable with it. But when I was on the receiving end, I found it. Well, wow. that's, <laughs> and that's good for, you know, therapists to know and to maybe have had that experience, you know, um, to know the vulnerability and to appreciate. It. And I think that we have to be, you know, particularly patient without an expectation around mm-hmm. and to who you know forming an attachment with us is going to you know that's a big stretch yeah yes it's such it's such a good reminder because you know and I always that's why I love learning more as a therapist experientially and also of course getting my own therapy because you know what everything we ask their our clients to do Mm-hmm. we need to know how it feels for us to do that. And if we, mm-hmm. you know, if we know how it feels, then we can allow ourselves to, I, I think it just opens up space for the client and you in that relationship so that you're not just like, why aren't they getting this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, this has been a really interesting conversation for me. I am so grateful that you agreed to be on Therapy Chat. Can you tell me, our listeners where people can find your blog and, and everything you're doing so they can get more of you? Yeah, well, uh, um, my website would be, I would say, the primary portal, um, jasminecorey.com. I have actually kind of resisted social media, so you, you won't find me there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I will make sure to put a link to your website in the show notes because you have all those other books as well. And um, you're an amazing resource for therapists and for clients. So thank you so much for being on Therapy Chat. Yeah, well, and thank you for this great conversation and these, these really good uh, questions. You're so welcome. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Jasmine Lee Corey about emotionally absent mothers and childhood emotional neglect. This is an issue that comes up in my practice all the time. It affects so many people between the ages of 30 to really no limit, but I see many people between the ages of 30 and 60 who are just understanding how much they've been affected by their childhood emotional neglect and wanting to feel different. The real message of this interview is that there's hope for anyone who's experienced childhood emotional neglect to heal from the effects. 
it doesn't matter that your parent may never be able to acknowledge that they weren't emotionally available for you in childhood. I mean, it would be great if they could apologize for that. And if they do, that's wonderful. But my point is, it's not dependent upon what they do, how you heal. You can heal even if your parent is no longer living, because it's not about getting an apology from them. Everything you need to heal from childhood emotional neglect is within you. And a therapist who's skilled in helping people who've experienced childhood emotional neglect can help you with that. If you're in Maryland, I am very happy to help you with that. You can check out my website, lauraregan.lcswc.com and see if you would like to set an appointment with me. And if you're a therapist and you're interested in help with this, I would be more than happy to consult with you as well. And I can also give you plenty of resources. But I do highly recommend Jasmine Corey's book, The Emotionally Absent Mother. I give it to clients all the time. I have several copies in my office that I lend out and people find it very helpful. So that's it for now. Until next time, thanks for listening. Hey, it's Laura Reagan again. I wanted to talk to you a little bit more in depth about therapy notes. Now, if you've been listening to Therapy Chat for a while, you might remember last summer when I was doing the practice building series for therapists, I interviewed Brad Pliner, who's the CEO of Therapy Notes, in episode 43, and he talked about why therapists need practice management systems and the specific benefits of using Therapy Notes. So if you're thinking about it, that would be a great episode to check out. I'm currently using it in a trial period. Even though I loved my other practice management system that I've had for going on four years, I was finally persuaded to switch to therapy notes. I think it's going to add a lot of value to my business and be cost effective for me in the long run. You can get 10% off 12 months of therapy notes service using the promo code CHAT17. The first month of service, including claims, ERAs, and appointment minders, is completely free. So you get a free month and 10% off 12 months of service. So hope you'll check it out. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com. 